guys! Today we're going to continue my rapid fire review of the 10 most important concepts for the SAT math section. Go check out my first video for the top 5 concepts I think you should definitely know, and today we're going to cover the next 5. These are equally important concepts that I think you really need to know to be able to succeed on the SAT math section. Knowing all of these will give you a huge leg up on your SAT. And again, I just want to put the disclaimer out there that this is not a comprehensive guide on every topic that will appear on the SAT math section, but once you learn these, you'll be in a much better place to tackle the harder questions. We'll go over a brief example problem for each of these most common concepts, and I'll also give you some topic-specific tips for each one. I'm also going to go in order of what I think are the most important to the least important to know, and the most likely to appear first. This is meant to give you a little taste of almost everything you'll encounter on the SAT math section, so you can see if there are any gaps in your knowledge. And if you realize you're struggling on some of these concepts, you should check out the sponsor of today's video, Linus Prep. Linus is the ultimate gamified way to study for your SAT. It's basically like Duolingo, but for the SAT. And the best part is, it's 100% free. I know a lot of you are stressed about your SAT, and are also probably slightly addicted to TikTok and video games like I am, and a lot of the time studying for the SAT can be a stressful, terrible time. But Linus is changing that. They know that when you're enjoying something and having fun, that typically leads to better outcomes. So they're making test prep fun and engaging with their platform and their small digestible lessons. You guys know that one of my main goals of my channel is to make test prep more accessible, and affordable to everyone, and Linus really supports that mission. They know that private tutors can make preparing for the SAT inaccessible for the majority of people because of how expensive private tutors can be, and so they've developed a brand new way to study that hasn't been really seen in the SAT test prep space before. The topics of the SAT are divided up into the math and reading sections, with subtopics along the way that are based on the new digital SAT, so it's up to date and it was designed for the current version of the test, unlike a lot of the test prep platforms that are just trying to scramble and adjust their content. The lessons are fast enough that you only really have to focus and study for a few minutes each day instead of having to dedicate hours to review a single concept. I've tested it out and I really like the way the different characters appear and tell a story as you go. It really helps reinforce concepts and topics that you're learning. There's also a lot of pressure to not just guess on the problems, but really try your best so you don't lose your, your hearts or your lives. Sometimes you need that little bit of external motivation to get through studying for something big like the SAT, and Linus gives you that motivation for free, where private tutors might cost hundreds of dollars an hour. I really think this could be the future of standardized test prep. What do you guys think? Anyway, the first 1,000 people that register for Linus will receive a free premium membership for life, so definitely check out the link in my description below to get started and sign up with them as soon as possible. There's no harm since it's completely free to create an account and start studying. Let's give a huge thanks to Linus for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into the 5 most important concepts to master for the SAT math section and go over some examples for each one. The first thing we'll talk about today is polynomials. And these are expressions with different powers of the same or different variables. You might need to know how to distribute these out, which you can do with the FOIL method. You also need to know that even if you have a complicated looking string of variables, you can add the coefficients of the two things together if their string of variables matches, just like how x plus 2x equals 3x. This rule applies to any matching terms, which can really help simplify expressions. So let's go over an addition and subtraction problem and a multiplication and division problem to get the hang of this. So, when we have a problem like this, which expression is equivalent to this thing, we see that all our answer choices are kind of distributed out. There aren't any parentheses. That's a hint that we'll probably have to do that. So let's start by distributing out this minus sign so we don't get confused later. And if you need help with how to do that, you can go to my last video. So we'll make it a negative x cubed plus a 3x, since a double negative is just a positive. Now, we can add like terms. So we can add terms with a similar variable. So we have two x cubed terms. We have seven x cubed and negative six x cubed. So we can just do seven minus six equals one x cubed. And then we have a seven x plus three x. That would just be 10 x. So our answer is A. Now, when we have multiplication, so if we have these two terms being multiplied together, the rules are a little bit different. We just add up the exponents of every term that's the same. So for m, we have an m to the fourth and an m to the one, so that would just be m to the fifth when it's added together. Same for q, so four plus five is nine, and z to the negative one times z to the third would just be z to the second, because three minus one is two. 
So that one's B. So the next thing you need to know is word problems, or how to set equations up. And this is based on a lot of the different skills we've talked about in the previous video. So go watch that if you'll need a refresher. So one of the trickier skills is kind of combining all these skills together that you've already learned and translating words into numbers when they give you that huge paragraph at the beginning of a problem. And this is useful in a lot of different scenarios. Okay, so for these word problems, it's very important to be able to turn words into an equation of some sort or an expression that's going to help you solve the problem. So we see that there's a candle made of 17 ounces of wax, so that's how much we have originally. Then when the candle is burning, it decreases by one ounce every four hours. So in other words, that's like 0.25 ounces per hour. Um, so if six ounces of wax remain in the candle, how many hours has it been burning? So we know we started with 17 ounces of wax, and we have six left, so that's 11 ounces that got burned off. And we know um, if it burns 0.25 ounces per hour, we can convert to hours with dimensional analysis, which is also in the last video. So we want to convert from ounces to hours. So we want the ounces on this side and hours on that side. Um, so we have one ounce every four hours, which would mean once we cancel these out, it takes 44 hours, or D. So this is a pretty common word problem that you'll see. It's just a system of linear equations in disguise. So the way to set these up, to get it right every time, is to have one equation for like the amount of money that something costs, and then one equation for the amount of the thing you have. So in this case it's candles. So we're going to have a candle, like how many candles equation, and how much money equation. We see that there's this much money that we have to purchase the candles, so it's going to be that equals however much each candle costs. So we have small candles and large candles. So there's 490 to purchase a small candle and 1160 to purchase a large candle. So that's our first equation. And then we know that we want at least 200 candles. That's the total amount of candles that we want. And that would just be S plus L. This S plus L is the amount of small and large candles we have times the price of each candle. So we have like total over here. This one is for money. This one is for candles. And that's how we set up this problem. So now we can use Desmos to solve this problem. We get 182 large candles. So the next thing is parallel and perpendicular lines and angles. So there are a lot of geometry concepts on the math modules, and some are harder than others, but I think the most basic one and the most important one to know is how parallel and perpendicular lines work. So you should know that a line has 180 degrees, so if two angles make up a line, those angles will add up to 180 degrees. And you can usually get away with using common sense on these types of problems. You don't really need to memorize the exact geometric theorem that makes something true, as long as it seems true to you. So let's go over an example of that. So for this one, remember that to get to a line, we need 180 degrees. You might remember this one particular theorem from geometry. When you have something kind of in a zigzag pattern like this, it will be the same, the same angle if you have these two intersecting lines. But if not, you can also just kind of guess. If they give you a number, that number will probably be used, and you can guess that this would be about 26 degrees. No geometric theorems needed. So then we know that our whole line is 180 degrees, so if we want to find x, we can do 180 minus 26, and that gets you 154 degrees. And if you don't remember this, you see that x is greater than 90 degrees, so you could probably just guess that the only one greater than 90 degrees is 154. So you should also know that two lines are perpendicular if they form a 90 degree angle between each other, and also know that if two lines are parallel, they'll never cross. So if we think of this in graph form, going back to that y equals mx plus b equation from my last video, the m, or the slopes, for the two perpendicular lines will be the negative reciprocals of each other. So like 2 and negative 1 half, or 3 fourths and negative 4 thirds. For parallel lines, the slopes will be the same as each other. So let's see how that works with problem solving. For these equations, we can use our knowledge of parallel lines. So remember, parallel lines are going to have the same slope when it's in y equals mx plus b form. So we're looking for an equation of a line that has the same slope and the correct y-intercept. So we're looking for a slope of 7, and then our y-intercept in this case is 0, 5. So we want a slope of 7 that passes through this line instead of this line. So remember that the y-intercept in y equals mx plus b form is just the b. And with a slope of 7, our equation would look like this. 
So now if you want to do perpendicular lines, remember that it's the inverse reciprocal to the slope. So we're trying to find the slope. It might help us to write this in y equals mx plus b form. So let's just rewrite this equation. So let's get our y alone. So we can do negative 18x plus 9. And we also want to divide by 2. So that's in the correct form now. So now to get the slope that we want, we just take this value and we invert it and we take the negative value of it. So perpendicular slopes of each other would be negative 9 and 1 ninth, or C in this case, since we're looking for the slope of line R, the perpendicular one. Alright, so on the SAT math section, there are a lot of statistics concepts that will come up as well, but most of them are covered if you know the mean, median, mode, and range. And pro tip, Desmos has functions to calculate all of these if they give you too many values in a data set and you really need to, to speed things up. So mean is the same as average, so those are basically synonymous. That's when you add up all of the data points in your data set and then divide by the number of points in the data set. And this way of analyzing data works best for cases when there aren't huge outliers, or else it'll affect the mean a lot. So to find the mean of something, we just add up all the values and then divide by the amount of values we have in the set. So let's do that really quick. Feel free to use a calculator to help you out. And then we have 10 values. So if we add these all up and divide by 10, we get a mean of 10. One handy thing is Desmos can actually calculate this for you, just like this. The mean is the same as the average, so you should be able to just use Desmos, plug in this data set, and it'll find the mean for you. So median is just the middlemost value of all your points. This can be a more accurate representation of your data than mean if there are those large outliers in your data set. Mode is just the number that comes up the most times in your data set, and range is how many values the data spans. So you can subtract the maximum and minimum points of your data set to find this value. And this is also heavily affected by outliers, like the mean is. So for this problem, we have data set A right here, and then we add 56 to each of the values. So essentially we just shift them over to get data set B. So we're trying to compare the medians and the ranges. Remember, range is just how much the data set spans. So if we shift it, the range actually shouldn't change at all because we're shifting every single value, but the median will change. The median will get a lot higher. So what choice best represents that? Well, we know that the median is greater and the range stays the same. So that would be choice C. So the last category we're going to cover today is nonlinear graphs. These are things like quadratics, cubics, and anything that's not defined by just a straight line, and how we are going to translate those or alter those graphs in any way. So for quadratics, you'll often be asked to find the minimum or maximum value of the graph. And this is just the lowest or highest point at the crest or the trough of the graph. And make sure to pay attention to whether it's asking you for the x value, the y value, or both. If it doesn't say, it's probably asking you for the y value. In general for these, it's more important to know about how shifting or changing a curve will change the equation itself. And this is where Desmos can be very handy. So my advice for these problems is to plug it into Desmos as much as you can anytime you're in doubt, whether you don't know whether subtracting to will move it up, down, left, or right, or you just need to compare different graphs that they give you. So to find the minimum value of a given function, I'd recommend just plugging this into Desmos, and the minimum is going to be the lowest point on the graph, and we see that that lowest point is at 55. So the minimum will always be the y value of what you're looking for. So in this case, it is 55, which we can see pretty easily in our equation, but it's always good just to confirm since you have Desmos. So in this case, again, if you don't remember your translations that well, you can just use Desmos for this. Let's graph y equals 7x cubed, and then let's graph um, y equals 7x cubed plus 2, and y equals 7x cubed minus 2, since we are shifting it, so it won't be getting this to a power or changing anything like that. And we see the one that shifts it down is the y equals 7x cubed minus 2. So that's our answer. So those are the main things that you have to know between this video and the last video. Some honorary mentions would be graphing circles, doing absolute value stuff, learning more about exponents and radicals, triangles, and the unit circle. So I'm not going to get into all of those in this video, but let me know if you'd like to see another video on the most advanced concepts of the SAT math modules. But honestly, once you're very comfortable with the 10 concepts I've covered in this series, you'll be prepared for the majority of the test. Anyway, thank you so much for watching today. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments down below. 
And be sure to check out Linus Prep in the description below to get your free premium membership today if you sign up fast enough. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon!